good, gorgeous fall equinox eve. I commend your choice of activity this evening because if after this presentation, you decide cover crops are right for your garden, the time to act is nigh, as in the next week, two weeks, two months, because we've got a fair amount to do and a short amount of time to do it with. If you're on this call tonight, it's likely because you love gardening. You love walking out and seeing lush growth, productive plants, perhaps a riot of color. And maybe it's been going well for a while and maybe right now it's not. So let's step back for just a minute and review what makes a great garden. The foundations, of course, are going to be sun, soil, water, and air. Sun, of course, because that's where all life starts. We want enough. We don't want too much. We don't want too little based on what plants we're growing. But sun is, of course, critical. And it also warms the earth so that the seeds can germinate and the roots can find their happy place. The soil, of course, needs to be teeming with life. There needs to be untold millions, if not trillions of microbes underneath our feet, all of which are meeting and greeting and mating and dying and eating and decomposing and sharing nutrients with each other and with the soil roots. And that's something that we actually have some control over. We are gonna need, that soil is going to need water, not just to keep the plants healthy and strong, but also for all those trillions of microbes in the soil. And the soil is going to need air, not just above ground so that the uh, plants can breathe in and out, but also below ground. So all of our trillion microbial friends can breathe because just like us, they need air too. So let's say we kind of know that, but we walk out into our garden. Maybe that's been for you this summer. I, we've suffered from this a little bit. We don't have that vibrant green. We don't have that super productive fruit or vegetable load. Instead, it's kind of looking like this. Got some color, got some plants going, but it's kind of looking tired. And maybe my tomatoes aren't as big. My peppers are a lot smaller. Something needs to be done. And tonight, we're going to figure out one of the ways to help that. It's the end of summer. A lot of us are saying, you know, please, I'm tired. I don't want to work on my tomatoes anymore. I'm ready to take everything out. Maybe I should just let the garden rest. Well, this is not such a great idea. Maybe you've driven up and down and around this great country of ours and you've seen these thousands of acres that look just like this. Not a blade of grass, nothing to be seen for miles around. And there was something to be said of why a long time ago, it's a you know, let the fields be fallow. Well, if you're, this is not soil. So um, this is, uh, hold on, let me just double check and make sure that my speakers are still working. Okay, we don't want this. This is not good soil management. There's a better way. Oops. You may remember if you've been taking gardening classes, maybe you've been on some of the Master Gardeners or the Libraries webinars before, there's something called the Soil Food Web. And it is an interconnected, interrelated, multi-level, 24-7 hodgepodge of incredible activity under the soil. At the soil roots, just in a nutshell, there are a lot of things called exudates. So the exudates are uh, combinations of carbohydrates and sugars that the plant is manufacturing through photosynthesis, shooting it down to the roots, feeding not just the plant roots, but also all the critters down next to the roots. There's a lot of bacteria down there, for example, teeny, teeny, tiny. We couldn't see them without like an electron microscope. Well, as the small things like the bacteria get eaten by the slightly larger yet still microscopic things like the protozoas, Every time something gets eaten by something bigger, it's going to throw off 
some the things it cannot digest like nitrogen. So nitrogen or the other minerals that are being thrown off because the critter that just ate the smaller critter can't digest it, those become immediately available to the plant roots and other microbes in the soil. So you've got this whole chain, not just a whole food chain going on, but the web going on of, like we said before, the microbes eating and meeting and greeting and mating and dying and decomposing. And the more of that that's going on, the healthier the soil. So we want to get our soil back to this, where everything is interacting with each other. And are there going to be some bad critters down in the soil too? You bet. But the goal is we have the good guys outnumbering the bad guys so that everybody is living as healthily as possible. So what are our keys to healthy soil? We now know we need to keep the soil covered at all times. Doesn't matter if it's fall, winter, spring, summer. We want to disturb the soil as little as possible. It used to be that, yeah, tilling was the way to go. We now know eh, eh, not a way to go anymore because it completely destroys all of those microbial levels, the mycorrhizal filaments, the networks that have been established in the soil for communication and for nutrient transfer. So we want to keep those intact. And the way that we do this, we need to keep plants growing throughout the year. And we need to diversify, we need to get as many different varieties of plants in the same area of soil, maybe not all at one time, but throughout the year. Because just like if we have diversification in our communities, we have more ideas, we, have, we eat better, we have more perspectives. So as above ground, also so below ground. So we need to be thinking about different types of crops we can put in our, um, our fields and in our beds. Advantages of cover crops. Believe it or not, there are legion. There are at least eight, and we might be able to squeeze, squeeze 10 out. Wow, look at this. We are going to go over these in a, a bit of detail. So I'm gonna start with this picture. Wow, it's going to look fairly similar to that picture we saw of just naked, bare, dead dirt because dirt is dead, soil is alive, it teems with activity. When either wind or water hits bare soil, it's not pretty. If it's wind, it's gonna to lift topsoil up into the air, taking it away from where it used to be. I actually heard many, many years ago that the United States number one unintended export was topsoil. And if you've ever seen those big tractors, they're tilling the fields and behind them is this huge plume of topsoil. That's not what we're going for today. Likewise, when rain hits bare soil, we think of rain as being, oh, yay, so nice falling from the sky. But if you've ever watched a slow motion video or movie of a water droplet hitting a surface, it explodes onto the surface and it's going to send loose particles up in the air, just like the wind would, and it actually can cause crusting because it's, it's filling in the, uh, the holes in the, of the soil aggregate. So we need to get rid of erosion, both wind and water. And one of the ways we can easily do this is with cover crop. Here's a picture of cover crop. So what cover crops do, planting so intensively, is it protects the ground above and below where plant meets earth. So think about that water. If it was coming down pretty hard, or even if it's just a gentle rain, if it's hitting the plant, the flowers, the leaves, the stems, those are guiding the raindrops down into the soil where the roots are going to already have established pathways that the water can follow. If we have a lot of plants in the ground, and I am praying we get some rain to test this um, proven fact at this point, we can absorb a lot more water before any runoff happens. So remember this picture because we want to 
grow plants about this closely together. And there are going to be a lot of roots in very close proximity to the other, which are going to mean there's a lot of food for our critters down there to eat. It's going to be attracting earthworms. Everybody's winning in this type of situation. Oh, this picture hurts my, hurts my head. We can enhance the water infiltration because we've got all of those roots, all of those live roots that are gently guiding the water down. We can reduce or mitigate the compaction, especially a lot of us have clay soils. I've got clay soils at the ranch and it's, it's, it's really hard to deal with. And cover cropping is definitely a way because with all of those roots going in, while they are alive, they're great channels for helping water uh, get down there. But when they die and they die back, they're leaving behind pathways that the next generation of plants can come in or the uh, water or nutrients can find their way in. This one's pretty cool. By planting intensively, and with some of our cover crop seeds germinating very quickly, we can smother the weeds. We can get the cover crops out of the gate faster than the weeds do. And some of the cover crop seeds we choose are allelopathic, meaning that they're going to exhibit, they're going to exude compounds into the soil that are going to make it less pleasant for the critters in the soil we don't want. Like maybe there's some worms that eat your corn. Uh, maybe there are uh, nematodes down there, like mustards, for example, are really good at exhibiting, at exuding compounds, like think mustard gas, that are going to make it so that the fungi, the uh, worms that used to be in your soil, they're going to decide it's not such a happy place down there anymore, and they're going to they're going to move on. So cover crops can smother weeds, and we they can exhibit and exude compounds that are going to get rid of what we don't want while encouraging what we do want. We're going to have a lot of plant action going on. We are going to be based on what we need our cover crops to do, which we'll cover in a little bit. We're going to be attracting some of the very insects that can help protect our garden. If you have had a lot of problems with aphids, for example, we want to be planting cover crops that will attract not just the ladybugs you see here, but the green lacewings, the circuit flies, the pirate bugs, the, min the minute bugs. There are all kinds of things that we know that we can plant in to address a particular pest or in a particular issue. And as we mentioned in the prior slide, your brassicas, your, your mustards in particular, they do have these compounds that can act as a biofumigation method. How cool is that? We mentioned earlier that we're going to probably be planting more than just one type of cover crop. And just as we like diversity in our communities, we've already talked about the benefits of that, we like diversity in our plant life because different plants, different plant roots are going to be looking for different things. They're going to be bringing different things up in the soil. So the more variety we have, the more advantages we have of what we can ask of our soils and what our soils are able to do. You've probably heard that one of the reasons you want to put mulch down is it can radically moderate soil temperatures. Well, compost, um, soil, the uh, cover crops, thank you. Cover crops are basically is a living mulch. If you've got a lot of biomass above and you've got a lot of roots in your soil, your uh, temperature outside can be very, very hot but all of that mass above ground is keeping the sun and the hot temperatures from reaching the soil. So if it's super cold, your soil stays warmer. If it's super hot, your soil stays cooler. Just as we mentioned, we know that we can plant to attract the air force that we need to offset the pests attacking our garden. We can also plant to attract pollinators. It's been a crazy year. It's been super hot, super dry. Uh, the bees are already beginning to suffer a little bit. 
we know that the butterflies are really having a tough time, we can choose plants in our cover crops that can bloom super early or bloom late so that we can keep more of a food supply there for our beneficials. And of course, it's been probably going to look fairly decent as well. Oh, look at this slide. We can have a riot of color in our cover crops. Here we are looking at white clover, crimson clover, and a mustard flower. But let's talk about how your cover crop bed is going to look. It will probably grow very quickly, and that's going to be pretty. But at some point, and we will definitely cover this in this presentation, you're going to have to take the cover crop down before you want your next crop to go in. There are a couple of ways of doing that, but also based on what you plant, as we come into winter, some of what you have planted may be killed by frost. This can be a really good thing, but we likely are going to want to leave the cover crop on your bed. So if you're used to a super neat and tidy garden with no weeds and no dead stuff on top, we may wish to get used to, mm, maybe I do want something uh, on the, it's, it's okay for there to be something dead. It, there's okay for there to be different levels of, of plant life that may not, that's in different stages of growing. So just know that a cover crop bed is going to look a little different throughout its cycle than a regular crop of tomatoes or corn would. So let's go into the types of cover crops because we have a fair amount to choose from. The three basic categories are your legumes, be thinking peas and beans. Their superpower is they have the ability to pull nitrogen out of the air through photosynthesis, shoot it down to the roots and have it available for both the plant to use the nitrogen and the other critters in the soil to, to be able to avail themselves of the nitrogen. Plants are amazing. I don't know if you know that most all plants actually will photosynthesize more sugars and carbohydrates than they actually need so that they can share with what else is at root level. I just, I just love that. So legumes fix nitrogen and you want to strongly consider your legumes, your beans and peas, following crops that have been heavy feeders, like your corn and your solanaceae, your tomatoes and peppers and potatoes. The only time you would not want to use a legume is if you already had a legume in the bed. So if you had a rip roaring or even, even a paltry green bean crop this summer, uh, you may, maybe you put in one legume cover crop mixed in with your grains and your broad leaves, but you would not want to follow a green bean crop with a fava bean soil crop because you've already had your nitrogen. You've already had that type of family in the soil. Next up are our grains and our grasses. Grains and grasses are phenomenal for busting up roots, or busting up uh clay soil for uh, going deeply into the soil. They also can create a fair amount of biomass above the ground and they have a place, especially in clay soils, but also in regular cover crops for raised beds. And we'll talk about more of these in a minute. Your broadleaf category is going to include your brassicas, like your radishes, which are great at busting up soil, your brassicas, which we said are great about biofumigation, but also your shorter crops like buckwheat, which we can put in tomorrow if we wanted, because buckwheat will go from seed to senescence, meaning the plant is dying, in only six weeks. It's a phosphorus pump. We love buckwheat. There are a couple of caveats we'll cover with that and a little bit. So those are your three main categories. And thankfully, a lot of the good seed companies are putting these three together in various mixes, or you could just get broad leaves and grains or legumes and grains. So if you go online and you enter in what type of problem or what uh, solution you're looking for in your soil, and you put in cover crop behind that, you'll be rewarded with information that will keep you at your computer for a couple of hours, I think. So the crop mixes are there and they make it so much easier, especially for the home gardener, to be able to target 
what we want. And you don't have to buy a pound of fava beans or a half ounce of, of uh, wheat or two pounds of uh, various mustard seeds. It can all be done together and for you. What kind of legumes am I talking about? Some of these are warm season. Some of these are cool season. Some of these are annuals. Some of these are perennials. Each has their place when you're considering cover crops. It is time to seriously consider our fava beans, our bell beans, and our Austrian field peas. Those are cool season crops and they need to get established before the cool weather hits us, which you know for us could be middle or end of November. And we'll get to that a little bit more also. Your cow peas are a wonderful summer cover crop. Maybe you've heard of black eyed peas. That's a bush and you can grow that. But considering that we are going to need to take all of our cover crops down before they set seed, I'd actually recommend instead of a black eyed pea, I would recommend Red Ripper cow peas because they are runners. They put out a lot of biomass. You can eat the leaves if you are so inclined, uh, but you're going to chop them before they set seed. And we'll go over why in a little bit. Vetch <clears throat> is primarily a warm season uh, legume. Very good at fixing nitrogen. Your clovers and your alfalfas, you have the option of choosing tall, short, perennial, or annual. And also, before I forget, when we started Rogers Ranch, we put in five by 20 foot beds. Uh, at the time, it seemed like it made a lot of sense, but I'm pretty short. My arms don't reach into the middle of a five foot bed very easily. So what I have started doing is down that center 12 inches, I will now put low growing perennial clover. Um, I'm, I'm trialing some alfalfa right now. Alfalfa is in one of those allelopathic, slightly allelopathic plants that will emit those compounds that will inhibit other plants from growing close to it. I haven't seen that much detrimental effect of the allelopathic properties and the trial is ongoing, but know that if you do have wide beds and it's hard for you to reach in there, you could consider an annual or a perennial cover crop that will be fixing nitrogen for you and for your other crops. And it makes it so much easier to work the bed. So those are uh, some ideas of you for legumes. The picture on the left here is what nitrogen looks like when it goes into nodule form on plant roots. If you've ever pulled up a fava bean or vetch or clover and it was in fairly loose soil and you saw this, you went, oh my gosh, what is that? This is really good stuff. The bigger and the more the nodules, the more nitrogen is available in your soil to that plant. And the picture on the right hand side, nature is so amazing at its reciprocity. The bacteria that are fixing those nodules need carbohydrates that the plant very willingly pulls down through photosynthesis, through its leaves and shoots into the roots. So the plant is giving the carbohydrates to the bacteria and the bacteria is giving nitrogen to the plant. Isn't that a beautiful relationship? I just love it. Let's move into our grains and our grasses. We've got uh, both winter, uh, fall and uh, spring, cool and warm season grasses and grains available to us. Again, what does your garden need? Are you trying to bust up clay soil? You may want to consider rye grass or rye cereal. Uh, when we were going through master gardeners classes of God, 10 years ago, one of the things that was said is one rye plant can slough off two miles of root hairs per season. Every time a root hair makes its way into soil, it's opening up a pathway. It's opening up a pathway that water, nutrients, the next generation of plant can come in. So this is all kind of good. But let me give you a little caveat. I learned this the hard way. I need rye grass or rye cereal at Rogers Ranch because of the clay. At El Monte, I have raised beds 
and they were all imported soil. I do not have hard clay. I did not need to put ryegrass in the El Monte beds. So what happens is the rye will, the, it forms really big root masses. And I wish I hadn't done it, but um, the other reason I wish I hadn't done it is I unfortunately let the crop go way too far, which you're not going to do because I'm going to tell you what happens, why, why you want to take the crop out when it's really supposed to come out. But um, if you've got rye, if you've got clay soil, consider rye. If you don't have clay soil, uh, may, you may be able to find something else, one of these other grasses or grains that makes um, more sense to you. The Sudan grass, I have not personally tried it, but I understand it makes a ton of biomass, which if you are composting at your site or at your home and you need good quality greens, uh, nitrogen to go into your compost pile, this is one of your tickets because you can cut it and it'll grow it back. You can cut it and it'll grow back. So it's an option. Again, know what you want out of your plants. Our broad leaves, our radishes, our biofumigations, our, um, oh, the, the radishes will break up the soil and you can um, you just leave them in the soil. You'll, you'll cut them off at soil level. But as the radish, and you can get a daikon radish, there is actually a radish called a bio drill. And I understand the seeds are fairly expensive. Daikon radishes work just fine, uh, much less expensive. You just leave the radish in the soil. And as it disintegrates, the, a, the microbes have lots of good stuff to eat. And it's opening up the pockets in the soil. I learned fairly recently that alyssum, that beautiful white fragrant flower that's in the bottom left, that's a member of the mustard family. It's a brassica. It has, um, it, it's a pretty good at growing fairly quickly and it's um, can, it's got its place as a cover crop. And of course, talk about attracting your green lace wings and your positive air force, your uh, mustards up there, that bright yellow, of course, is going to be a bee magnet. And how pretty is that to look at? The buckwheat is on the lower right-hand side. It's very fast plant. Again, six weeks from the time you put the seed in the ground until the time you're going to be taking it down. If it does go, it does go from seed to, no, it goes from flower to seed fairly quickly. But you know what? I don't care. It's so easy for it to come out. The only time you would not want to let your buckwheat go to seed is if you are planting carrots immediately after it, because the buckwheat will outcompete your carrot seed because the buckwheat is really fast to germinate and it will crowd out your carrot seeds, which we all know take several weeks to germinate. Again, your crop mixes. We are looking at, on the left-hand side, we've got favas, we've got grasses, we've got field peas, we've got brassicas, and look how healthy that looks. Everything's growing really well together because it's not going to stay in the ground that long. And on the right-hand side, we've got some mustards again and some taller fava beans. All right. Let's talk about some factors that you may wish to consider if you are interested in putting cover crops in. First of all, we've already mentioned, what problem do you need to address? Is it compaction? Is it low nutrients? Is it erosion? Is it um, uh, bad fungi in the soil for which you may need to get a soil test to actually tell you what you got? Think about the costs. Um, not just the cost of the seed, which is, in all honesty, not going to be that much if you're a home gardener, but there's going to be a labor cost here. You're going to need to prep the bed, and we'll talk about this in a minute, and you're going to need to broadcast the seeds. You're going to need to water it. You're going to need to know when it should be coming out, and you're going to have to take it out. And if, you, if, you are, if your beds are in bed, I mean, if, you, if you're growing in a place where you've got a mower and you can push the mower over it, that's not going to be that hard to do. But if you've got your big beds, like we've got a boatload of five by 20 beds, I'm going to have to take the irrigation lines out of it first. And then either with a scythe or with really sharp shears, uh, because I don't have any electric uh, 
chopping equipment, um, I'm going to have to go through and cut everything off at ground level. And I'm going to have to know how soon I'm going to want my next crop coming in so that I know when to back into taking the cover crop down. So there's some costs there. Also, that bed is not going to be able to grow anything else while you're growing a cover crop. That said, I still recommend cover crops because of all the benefits we've already gone through. What cover crops should be sequenced based on what is currently in your beds? Again, we, we have already said don't follow a legume with legume, but based on what your plant families are, what logically makes sense to come next? And what size area are you considering? Do you even just want to try a small test plot first? Um, another option is, would something else make sense for what you are trying to make happen? Would wood mulch, for example, wood chips, would if, if the problem is you want to keep your soil covered, but your friability is pretty good and your nutrient load seems to be fairly good, um, and you just don't have a lot of time or energy right now, maybe put on some wood chips. So those are some factors to consider. Uh, but with some, we already mentioned uh, interplanting. So let's say you've got some kale or kale trees in and they're going fairly well. Maybe they're getting a little bit tired, uh, but you'd like to keep them in, but you've got bare ground underneath them. Well, put in some alyssum. Uh, investigate what cover crops, maybe some of your uh, low growing clovers might be an idea. So there are, the main thing is gonna take a little bit of time is, what do you want to do? What do you want to have happen? And what's in there now? What do you want to be coming in in a couple of months? And you just sort of work your way through that. The good news is gardening is such an adventure. And you know we never have any failures. We just have results that we can tell others about. So pretty much anything you do, I encourage you to at least try. When to plant them? I opened this talk by saying, if we're gonna put in some uh, winter or fall cool season cover crops, the time is now. Now, some of you are already taken out your tomatoes. We still have ours in, but some of ours are getting really long in the tooth. So I will probably be taking them out within the next week. I will um, take the diseased tomatoes out. I'm pulling them out by the roots and I will be following with a combination of legumes and grasses for my adobe clay soil and my broad leaf. So I'm gonna do a full spectrum cover crop. You want to get these in before the period of Persephone pops in. So um, oh, uh, I'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, the, what you're looking at in the middle picture, those are field peas. And I use Austrian field peas. They're, they're uh, hardy down to zero Fahrenheit. And they give me salad all winter. I know I started by saying cover crops are grown for the soil, not for human or animal consumption. But part of what I love about permaculture is I find plants that can do double and triple duty. Field peas are one of those. I always have these planted around school beds because kids and adults love them. I can eat the tendrils and the leaves. Each one of the leaves and tendrils tastes like a fresh pea. So it's great. And I don't, I'm not interested in the field peas themselves. They're mushy, they're chalky, and I've got to cut the plants down before then anyway. So I can let them go to flower just like you see here. But after that, boom, they need to go. The plant on the right is called Phacelia, P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A, I believe, Phacelia, yeah. It's one of the first flowers out in the spring. It's a multi-stamened bloom. And while honeybees are not that interested in it, native bees go nuts for this plant. If you stand around a blooming Phacelia for five to 10 minutes, just count all the native bees that are on it. It's a, it's a thing of beauty. Here is an example of some of the things we can now plant. It's perfectly fine to start getting these into the ground. If you don't recognize this plate over here on the right, that is Persephone. If you're not familiar with the myth of Persephone, it's really worth looking up. But bottom line is our plants grow well as long as there are 10 or more hours of sunlight. 
when we cross that threshold under 10 hours, plants will either go sort of more into stasis. They're just going to, they're just not going to, they're going to hang out. They're not going to do a whole lot. So our period of Persephone in Contra Costa is roughly November 20th through January 20th. So a couple of years ago, I was thinking, oh, fine, I'll get my plants in a couple of days before November 20th and life will be good. The answer is no, it won't. You need to have your plants in the ground and established by November 20th. So if you're interested in putting any of these that you see on the left-hand side in place, go ahead and start thinking about it now. You want them in the ground for at least a month. So Persephone, look up the myth. It's really, it's a sweet little myth. Maybe you want to get a spring cover crop in before you put in your summer vegetables. That's okay to do too. You can start thinking about it or get them in the ground after January 20th, after we get our um, period of Persephone out of the way. Um, after, you after you take whatever crop is in your beds out, you may immediately sow cover crop seeds. That's fine. But if you're going to take a cover crop out so that you can get something else in, you will need to take your cover crop out three to four weeks before your next crop goes in. We'll talk about why in another slide or two. Spring planting cover crops, got a lot of varieties and a lot of options here. And the other thing is you can also always start these crops and if you decide, oh, wait a minute, I really need that bed faster than I thought I could, than I was going to, you can go ahead and take the cover crop out. They do not have to go to flower. You can cut them down before then. Summer cover crops. Look at these grains. You've got your sorghum and your amaranth. Who knew the sunflowers could be a, summer, a cover crop? We use it as a cover crop just because nature has planted it all over El Monte and Rogers Ranch. So we have tons of sunflowers. Birds love it. Bees love it. And they have such a long season. And of course I can use it if, I, if you've got a chipper shredder, you can also use your sunflower stalks going into your uh, compost. They do otherwise take a really long time to decompose. What are you going to need if you decide you want to put in a cover crop? Not that many materials and chances are you already have a lot of these on site. Yes, you will order some cover crop seeds or you will buy some cover crop seeds. Some of the nurseries around here uh, carry them. And again, so if you've got seed catalogs at home, look in there. They may already have some crop mixes made for you or individuals. And some of the seed catalogs have outstanding charts that you can drill down to exactly what you want and exactly what to plant. If you've got any good quality compost, oh, actually, I just skipped over inoculants. For your legumes, for your peas and your beans, they will work better. They will affix more nitrogen if you can coat them with an inoculant, with some bacteria that is going to help the plant start putting nitrogen into the soil, into the roots faster. And I've got a slide that will show you what that looks like in a minute. If you've got some good quality compost, that's great to have on hand. Shears to cut down whatever is currently in your bed or a mower, depending on what it is. A rake so that you can make the bed level. Water from a hose, a watering can, possibly drip irrigation or overhead sprayers. A place to put your leftover seeds. And I highly recommend a place that you put either in your computer, in your calendar, or a notebook when the cover crop is going in and when you need to take it out. It is so easy to let cover crops go beyond where they need to be. And it's going to be harder to take them out if you leave them in too long. And if they go to seed, you've just undone all of the time that your cover crop was in the ground, pulling up the nutrients, fixing the nitrogen. So you want to make sure you get it out when it needs to come out. How to plant and harvest. We're in the home stretch, guys. How you're going to prepare your bed, whether it is a raised bed or in bed gardening, you're going to 
cultivate the surface. What do I mean by that? You want to get the old, if, if it's time to take the old crop out, take the old crop out. Again, if it's diseased, pull it out by the roots, otherwise cut it off at soil level. If you still have your tomatoes or whatever in, you can still prepare the bed, but just you're going to want to pull the detritus, um, detritus, however you pronounce that, away from the plants uh, so that when you put the seed down, it actually has a chance of finding the soil. You'll add some compost. We're not going to fertilize at this point. Compost is all we're going to need. Rake to make a level surface. And then most of your seeds are, especially if you're using a mix, just broadcast them, put them in your hand and just very gently shake them out, getting the surface as evenly uh, covered with your seeds as you can. As you can. Your exception, again, I'm going to go to the next slide very soon, is you're going to put your inoculant on your fava beans, on your peas, on your beans first. And I've got a picture of fava beans there to remind me, uh, because those are big beans. Of course, if you broadcast your fava beans, they have super thick seed coats on them, and it's going to take them longer to germinate. I actually will, I will um, put my, I, I start my fava beans in seed trays. You don't have to. It's just a faster and more reliable way for me. And then I can exactly plant them where I want. Um, it says down here, broadcast seeds, except legumes, add inoculant. For favas, plant on 12 inch centers. That means from where one fava is going in the bed to the next fava going in the bed, 12 inches. I actually also use six inch centers and it works fine because again, once that stalk, once the stalks start going to flower, I'm cutting the thing down. I'm going to cover that compost again if you've got it. They've got the seeds have got to get enough water to germinate. So if we are not expecting rain, you're going to need to water it in with hose or whatever watering means you've got. And going back to the question earlier of why did I only get two um, clover sprouts uh, last year? Cover it with bird netting. It does not have to be a high hoop the way this picture is. It can be a low hoop, but somehow you, you can use tool, use whatever you've got, Rime, Agrabond, whatever you have, but at least for the first couple of weeks, if you can protect those seedlings from the birds, you'll have a much better germination rate. Here is the inoculant, I promised you. Inoculant is usually quite dark, black actually. You can get it in granular form. You can get it as like a powder, almost like a consistency of flour. A lot of the gardening stores will have it. You may, depending on how serious you're getting about your cover crops, you can get inoculants targeted toward exactly what it is you are growing. So if a fava bean inoculant, a cowpea inoculant, a, a whatever. There are also just broad spectrum inoculants. It's not that expensive. They do have expiry dates though. So do be aware that they're not gonna last a whole lot from, from year to year. How do you do it? You put your seeds, and those are peas by the way in the bowl on the right. Put your seeds in, or beans or peas or whatever, in the bowl. Uh, gonna sprinkle the inoculant over them and you're gonna add enough water to create a slurry. I actually am a huge fan of soaking my beans in peas up to an hour because as the seed coat starts to swell, it's gonna buy me some time in germinating. So it's going to help them germinate faster. So what do I do after about an hour of my seeds inoculating? Then I'll pick them out. And for the uh, beans and peas like this, the smaller ones, I will broadcast them for the fava beans, I do put them in seed trays, or you can figure out a way of making about an inch deep holes and put them in the holes and then cover up the holes. Either way is going to work. Again, got to water. We don't know what we're looking at this fall. You've got to get them wet. You've got to keep them moist. What we have found works best for cover crop germination is not drip irrigation, but actually overhead watering. So we put in um, the, the risers are about, I don't know, uh, six, maybe 12 inches above the soil. And whereas we would normally have a drip irrigation schedule, 
we have the overhead spray and it just seems really helpful. And after about two weeks, once I've got them germinated and they look like they're going fairly well, then we will take off the overhead sprays and put back down the drip irrigation. And of course, we are all gonna pray for rain. That's one of the reasons people used to put in cover crops over the winter because the rain was doing the watering for them and it gave the gardeners a chance to rest and it was doing such benefits for the soil. Cover crops will grow fairly quickly. You've got three pictures here from uh, what, just a little over a month. And it's pretty fun to watch them take off. Harvesting. There are a couple of ways you're gonna know when it's time to take the crop out. I've said it, I think till uh, several times now, don't let it go to seed. Uh, you've lost your nutrient load. Uh, you've lost uh, the, the flexibility of the plant. Just once it starts setting flowers, when I originally learned about cover crops, I had been told, especially for your fava beans, if once it goes to 50% flower, meaning the, the blooms or the blossoms are marching up the stalk, but it has not set pods yet. Well, the latest uh, webinar I attended said, when they start to flower, get them down. So that's really hard for me for fava beans. So I recommend putting in bell beans if you love to eat fava bean pods as much as I do. And just have your own fava bean bed set for what you'll be eating. You're gonna cut your grains, legumes, broad leaves at the base. Again, you can see this, this charming child has shears that she's going in. And again, if you've got drip irrigation in the beds, trust me, get the drip irrigation lines out first, no matter how good and how careful you think you're gonna be with those shears. You've got two options as you're taking out the cover crop. You can chop and drop, um, cutting it into fine pieces, leaving it on the top of the bed, letting it act as mulch, letting it decompose. This is where the prior question of let it sit for three or four weeks because you're gonna, gonna have a lot of microbial action trying to break down all the matter, the mass, the biomass that has now been separated from its roots, but is still on top of the soil. Your other option is to cart that biomass off and put it in your compost pile. Marion, I'm giving you a five minute check. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That are you on? You, you just went quiet again. Okay, good. I think, I think I'm back. So this says if composting in place, you can cover it with finished compost, always a great idea. You can transplant your next crop straight in, but you do need to wait three to four weeks. How do you know how much? Well, hopefully you've got a soil thermometer. So what you're gonna do when you take out your cover crop, you're gonna stick a soil thermometer in and you're going to take that temperature. Every couple of days, you're gonna monitor the temperature as the soil is handling the plants on top of it, especially maybe with a broad fork or with a, a spading fork, you've sort of worked the cover crop into the soil. You're gonna be watching the temperature rise. After two or three or four weeks, the temperature is gonna start going back down again. Once it is a stable temperature, you can plant your next crop in. If you are doing the chop and drop method, if you have worked your cover crop in a little bit, I don't recommend seeding your next crop because the same critters that are decomposing your cover crop are just gonna see your seed and they go, oh good, extra Scooby snack. Now you can transplant straight into there if your transplants are at least four inches, they'll have the root structure strong enough to keep going. Let's see, I think I'm about done. If I could just get the screen to move. So again, what are you trying to do? What's the purpose of the cover crop? Make sure you've got your timing down. When do you want your cover crop to go in? When you are reading about cover crops, learn about their maturity dates. Another way you know when it's time to take the cover crop down, you know, when plants are just starting to grow and they've got that good green, they're, they're, they're nubile, they're uh, flexible. When it stops doing that, when it starts to go stalky or fibrousy or starchy, go ahead and take them down. Be thinking, do you want a single crop? Do you want a mixed crop? Do you want 
annuals? Do you want it to be perennials? And then just decide how you're going to harvest and what you're going to do with the cover crop. I think I did it. Just a review of some of the advantages of using cover crops. I hope you'll consider it even for a small space. And a, a one thing I haven't brought up, if you do this one time, you may see a difference. Hopefully you will. It's doing it year after year, crop after crop, that's going to make a huge difference. The Master Gardeners, our garden, have they started cover cropping about three years ago because the soil was just too tired. It wasn't doing what we needed it to do anymore. Every year we put in a cover crop. The soil is more friable, it's richer, it supports more life, we get more yield out of it. So cover crops, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learned something tonight. And Sean, back to you.